can young Beautrelet really solve a crime which absolutely baffles the police? Maurice LeBlanc, today on the Classic Tales podcast. Welcome to the Classic Tales podcast. Thank you for listening. Thank you to all of our financial supporters. We couldn't do this without you. We really try to make your support worth your while. You get so much out of this. For a $5 monthly donation, you get a monthly coupon code for $8 off any audiobook download. Give more and you get more. It kind of cracks open the website for you, so you can easily build out your classic audiobook library and you help to give more folks like you the chance to discover the classics in a curated and easily accessible format. Go to ClassicTalesAudiobooks.com today and become a financial supporter. You'll be glad you did. Thank you so much. For those of you who enjoy the personal moments, I've decided to release those stories as a special feature you can access in the app. That way they don't get in the way here, but for those who enjoy them, they are still available through the app. Last week, our story began. There was a late-night struggle in the mansion of Monsieur de Gevre, and his secretary, Monsieur de Val, was found dead. Monsieur de Gevre was unharmed, but a man was seen on the grounds carrying something. Before he got too far, he was shot by a witness from the house. He apparently remained trapped in the grounds, but was never discovered. Young Isidore Beautrelet, a local student, posed as a journalist and seemed to have a peculiarly intimate knowledge of the case. Let's see what he can tell us. And now, The Hollow Needle, Part 2 of 7, by Maurice LeBlanc. Chapter 2. Isidore Beautrelet. Sixth Form Schoolboy From the Grand Journal Latest News Dr. de Latre Kidnapped A Mad Piece of Criminal Daring At the moment of going to press, we have received an item of news which we dare not guarantee as authentic, because of its very improbable character. We print it, therefore, with all reserve. Yesterday evening, Dr. de Latre the well-known surgeon, was present, with his wife and daughter, at the performance of Hernani at the Comédie Française. At the commencement of the third act, that is to say, at about ten o'clock, the door of his box opened, and a gentleman, accompanied by two others, leaned over to the doctor, and said to him, in a low voice, but loud enough for Madame de Latre to hear, Doctor, I have a very painful task to fulfill and I shall be very grateful to you if you will make it as easy for me as you can. Who are you, sir? Monsieur Tézard, commissary of police of the first district, and my instructions are to take you to Monsieur Dudouis at the prefecture. But— Not a word, doctor. I entreat you, not a movement. There is some regrettable mistake, and that is why we must act in silence and not attract anybody's attention. You will be back, I have no doubt— before the end of the performance. The doctor rose and went with the commissary. At the end of the performance, he had not returned. Madame de Latre, greatly alarmed, drove to the office of the commissary of police. There she found the real Monsieur Tézard, and discovered, to her great terror, that the individual who had carried off her husband was an impostor. Inquiries made so far have revealed the fact that the doctor stepped into a motor-car and that the car drove off in the direction of the Concorde. Readers will find further details of this incredible adventure in our second edition. Incredible though it might be, the adventure was perfectly true. Besides, the issue was not long delayed, and the Grand Journal, while confirming the story in its midday edition, described in a few lines the dramatic ending with which it concluded. The story ends and guesswork begins. Dr. de Latre was brought back to 78 Rue du Ray at nine o'clock this morning in a motor-car which drove away immediately at full speed. 
number 78, Rue Duret, is the address of Dr. Delattre's clinical surgery, at which he arrives every morning at the same hour. When we sent in our card, the doctor, though closeted with the chief of the detective service, was good enough to consent to receive us. All that I can tell you, he said in reply to our questions, is that I was treated with the greatest consideration. My three companions were the most charming people I have ever met, exquisitely well-mannered and bright and witty talkers, a quality not to be despised, in view of the length of the journey. How long did it take? About four hours and as long returning. And what was the object of the journey? I was taken to see a patient whose condition rendered an immediate operation necessary. And was the operation successful? Yes, but the consequences may be dangerous. I would answer for the patient here. Down there, under his present conditions, bad conditions, execrable, a room in an inn, and the practically absolute impossibility of being attended to. Then what can save him? A miracle and his constitution, which is an exceptionally strong one. And can you say nothing more about this strange patient? No. In the first place, I have taken an oath, and secondly, I have received a present of ten thousand francs for my free surgery. If I do not keep silence, this sum will be taken from me. You are joking. Do you believe that? Indeed I do. The men all struck me as being very much in earnest. This is the statement made to us by Dr. Delattre, and we know, on the other hand, that the head of the detective service, in spite of all his insisting, has not yet succeeded in extracting any more precise particulars from him as to the operation which he performed, the patient whom he attended, or the district traversed by the car. It is difficult, therefore, to arrive at the truth. This truth which the writer of the interview confessed himself unable to discover, was guessed by the more or less clear-sighted minds that perceived a connection with the facts which had occurred the day before at the Chateau d'Ambrumacy, and which were reported, down to the smallest detail, in all the newspapers of that day. There was evidently a coincidence to be reckoned with in the disappearance of a wounded burglar and the kidnapping of a famous surgeon. The judicial inquiry, moreover, proved the correctness of the hypothesis. By following the track of the sham flyman, who had fled on a bicycle, they were able to show that he had reached the forest of Arc, at some ten miles distance, and that from there, after throwing his bicycle into a ditch, he had gone to the village of St. Nicolas, whence he had dispatched the following telegram. A.L.N. Post Office, 45, Paris Situation desperate. Operation urgently necessary. Send celebrity by National Road 14. The evidence was undeniable. Once apprised, the accomplices in Paris hastened to make their arrangements. At ten o'clock in the evening, they sent their celebrity by National Road number 14, which skirts the forest of Arc and ends at Dieppe. During this time, under cover of the fire which they themselves had caused, the gang of burglars carried off their leader and moved him to an inn, where the operation took place on the arrival of the surgeon at two o'clock in the morning. About that there was no doubt. At Pontoise, at Gournay, at Forges, Chief Inspector Ganimard, who was sent specially from Paris with Inspector Follenfant as his assistant, ascertained that a motor car had passed in the course of the previous night the same on the road from Dieppe to Ambrumacy. And though the traces of the car were lost at about a mile and a half from the chateau, at least a number of footmarks were seen between the little door in the park wall and the abbey ruins. Besides, Ganimard remarked that the lock of the little door had been forced. So all was explained. It remained to decide which inn the doctor had spoken of. An easy piece of work for a Ganimard, a professional ferret, a patient old stager of the police. The number of inns is limited, and this one, given the condition of the wounded man, could only be one quite close to Ambrumacy. 
Ganimard and Sergeant Quevillon set to work. Within a circle of five hundred yards, of a thousand yards, of fifteen hundred yards, they visited and ransacked everything that could pass for an inn. But against all expectation, the dying man persisted in remaining invisible. Ganimard became more resolved than ever. He came back to sleep at the chateau on the Saturday night, with the intention of making his personal inquiry on the Sunday. On Sunday morning, he learned that, during the night, a posse of gendarmes had seen a figure gliding along the sunk road outside the wall. Was it an accomplice who had come back to investigate? Were they to suppose that the leader of the gang had not left the cloisters or the neighborhood of the cloisters? That night, Ganimard openly sent the squad of gendarmes to the farm and posted himself and Folinfant outside the walls near the little door. A little before midnight, a person passed out of the wood, slipped between them, went through the door, and entered the park. For three hours, they saw him wander from side to side across the ruins, stooping, climbing up the old pillars, sometimes remaining for long minutes without moving. Then he went back to the door and again passed between the two inspectors. Ganimard caught him by the collar, while Follenfant seized him round the body. He made no resistance of any kind, and, with the greatest docility, allowed them to bind his wrists and take him to the house. But when they attempted to question him, he replied simply that he owed them no account of his doings, and that he would wait for the arrival of the examining magistrate. Thereupon, they fastened him firmly to the foot of a bed in one of the two adjoining rooms which they occupied. At nine o'clock on Monday morning, as soon as Monsieur Fiol had arrived, Ganimard announced the capture which he had made. The prisoner was brought downstairs. It was Isidore Beautrelet. Monsieur Isidore Beautrelet, exclaimed Monsieur Fiol, with an air of rapture, holding out both his hands to the newcomer. What a delightful surprise! Our excellent amateur detective here, and at our disposal, too. Why, it's a windfall, Monsieur Chief Inspector. Allow me to introduce you to Monsieur Isidore Beautrelet, a sixth-form pupil at the Lycée Janson de Sailly. Ganimard seemed a little nonplussed. Isidore made him a very low bow, as though he were greeting a colleague whom he knew how to esteem at his true value, and turning to Monsieur Fiol, It appears, Monsieur le Juge d'Instruction, that you have received a satisfactory account of me? Perfectly satisfactory. To begin with, you were really at violet les roses at the time when Mademoiselle de saint Varin thought she saw you in the sunk road. I dare say we shall discover the identity of your double. In the second place, you are in very deed Isidore Beautrelet, a sixth-form pupil and, what is more, an excellent pupil industrious at your work and of exemplary behaviour. As your father lives in the country, you go out once a month to his correspondent, Monsieur Bernot, who is lavish in his praises of you. So that, so that you are free, Monsieur Isidore Beautrelet. Absolutely free? Absolutely. Oh, I must make just one little condition, all the same. You can understand that I can't release a gentleman who administers sleeping draughts who escapes by the window, and who is afterward caught in the act of trespassing upon private property. I can't release him without a compensation of some kind. I await your pleasure. Well, we will resume our interrupted conversation, and you shall tell me how far you have advanced with your investigations. In two days of liberty, you must have carried them pretty far. And as Ganimar was preparing to go, with an affectation of contempt for that sort of practice, the magistrate cried, Not at all, Monsieur Inspector. Your place is here. I assure you that Monsieur Isidore Beautrelet is worth listening to. Monsieur Isidore Beautrelet, according to my information, has made a great reputation at the Lycée Janson de Sailly as an observer whom nothing escapes. And his schoolfellows, I hear, look upon him as your competitor and a rival of Sherlock Holmes. Indeed, 
said Ganimard, ironically. Just so. One of them wrote to me, If Beautrelet declares that he knows, you must believe him, and whatever he says, you may be sure that it is the exact expression of the truth. Monsieur Isidore Beautrelet, now or never is the time to vindicate the confidence of your friends. I beseech you, give us the exact expression of the truth. Isidore listened with a smile and replied, Monsieur le juge d'instruction, you are very cruel. You make fun of poor schoolboys who amuse themselves as best they can. You are quite right, however, and I will give you no further reason to laugh at me. The fact is that you know nothing, Monsieur Isidore Beautrelet. Yes, I confess in all humility that I know nothing, for I do not call it knowing anything that I happen to have hit upon two or three more precise points which, I am sure, cannot have escaped you. For instance? For instance, the object of the theft. Ah, of course, you know the object of the theft. As you do, I have no doubt. In fact, it was the first thing I studied, because the task struck me as easier. Easier? Really? Why, of course. At the most, it is a question of reasoning. Nothing more than that. Nothing more. And what is your reasoning? It is just this. Stripped of all extraneous comment, on the one hand there has been a theft, because the two young ladies are agreed, and because they really saw two men running away and carrying things with them. There has been a theft. On the other hand, nothing has disappeared, because Monsieur de Gevre says so, and he is in a better position than anybody to know. Nothing has disappeared. From those two premises, I arrive at this inevitable result. Granted that there has been a theft and that nothing has disappeared, it is because the object carried off has been replaced by an exactly similar object. Let me hasten to add that possibly my argument may not be confirmed by the facts, but I maintain that it is the first argument that ought to occur to us, and that we are not entitled to waive it until we have made a serious examination. That's true. That's true, muttered the magistrate, who was obviously interested. Now, continued Isidore, what was there in this room that could arouse the covetousness of the burglars? Two things. The tapestry first. It can't have been that. Old tapestry cannot be imitated. The fraud would have been palpable at once. There remain the four Rubens pieces. What's that you say? I say that the four Rubenses on that wall are false. Impossible! They are false a priori, inevitably and without a doubt. I tell you it's impossible. It is very nearly a year ago, Monsieur le Juge d'Instruction, since a young man, who gave his name as Charpenet, came to the Chateau d'Ambrumacy, and asked permission to copy the Rubens' pictures. Monsieur de Gevre gave him permission. Every day for five months, Charpenet worked in this room from morning till dusk. The copies which he made, canvases and frames, have taken the place of the four original pictures bequeathed to Monsieur de Gevre by his uncle, the Marc de Bobadilla. Prove it. I have no proof to give. The picture is false because it is false, and I consider that it is not even necessary to examine these four. Monsieur Fiole and Ganimard exchanged glances of unconcealed astonishment. The inspector no longer thought of withdrawing. At last the magistrate muttered, We must have Monsieur de Gevre's opinion. And Ganimard agreed, Yes, we must have his opinion and they sent to beg the Count to come to the drawing-room. The young sixth-form pupil had won a real victory. To compel two experts, two professionals, like Monsieur Fiole and Ganimard, to take account of his surmises, implied a testimony of respect, of which any other would have been proud. But Beautrelet seemed not to feel those little satisfactions of self-conceit, and still smiling without the least trace of irony, he placidly waited. 
Monsieur de Gevre entered the room. Monsieur le Comte, said the magistrate, the result of our inquiry has brought us face to face with an utterly unexpected contingency, which we submit to you with all reserve. It is possible, I say that it is possible, that the burglars, when breaking into the house, had it as their object to steal your four pictures by Rubens, or at least to replace them by four copies, copies which are said to have been made last year by a painter called Charpenet. Would you be so good as to examine the pictures, and to tell us if you recognize them as genuine? The Count appeared to suppress a movement of annoyance, looked at Isidore Beautrelet and at Monsieur Fiole, and replied without even troubling to go near the pictures, I hoped, Monsieur le Juge d'Instruction, that the truth might have remained unknown. As it is not so, I have no hesitation in declaring that the four pictures are false. You knew it then, from the beginning. Why didn't you say so? The owner of a work is never in a hurry to declare that that work is not, or rather is no longer, genuine. Still it was the only means of recovering them. I consider that there was another and a better. Which was that? Not to make the secret known. Not to frighten my burglars, and to offer to buy back the pictures, which they must find more or less difficult to dispose of. How would you communicate with them? As the Count did not reply, Isidore answered for him. By means of an advertisement in the papers. The paragraph inserted in the agony column of the journal, the Echo de Paris and the Matin, runs, Am prepared to buy back the pictures. The Count agreed with a nod. Once again the young man was teaching his elders. Monsieur Fiol showed himself a good sportsman. "'There's no doubt about it, my dear sir,' he exclaimed. "'I'm beginning to think your schoolfellows were not quite wrong. By Jove, what an eye! What intuition! If this goes on, there will be nothing left for Monsieur Ganimard and me to do.' "'Oh, none of this part was so very complicated. You mean to say that the rest was more so? I remember, in fact, that when we first met you seemed to know all about it.' Let me see, as far as I recollect, you said that you knew the name of the murderer. So I do. Well, then, who killed Jean Daval? Is the man alive? Where is he hiding? There is a misunderstanding between us, Monsieur le Juge d'Instruction. Or rather, you have misunderstood the facts from the beginning. The murderer and the runaway are two distinct persons. What's that? exclaimed Monsieur Fiole. The man whom Monsieur de Gevre saw in the boudoir and struggled with, the man whom the young lady saw in the drawing-room, and whom Mademoiselle de saint veran shot at, the man who fell in the park, and whom we are all looking for, do you suggest that he is not the man who killed Jean Daval? I do. Have you discovered the traces of a third accomplice, who disappeared before the arrival of the young ladies? I have not. In that case I don't understand— well, who is the murderer of Jean Duval? Jean Duval was killed by... Beautrelet interrupted himself, thought for a moment, and continued. But I must first show you the road which I followed to arrive at the certainty and the very reasons of the murder, without which my accusation would seem monstrous to you. And it is not. No, it is not monstrous at all. There is one detail which has passed unobserved and which, nevertheless, is of the greatest importance, and that is that Jean de Val, at the moment when he was stabbed, had all his clothes on, including his walking boots, was dressed, in short, as a man is dressed in the middle of the day, with a waistcoat, collar, tie, and braces. Now, the crime was committed at four o'clock in the morning. I reflected on that strange fact, said the magistrate, and Monsieur de Gevre replied, that Jean de Val spent a part of his nights in working. The servants say, on the contrary, that he went to bed regularly at a very early hour, but, admitting that he was up, why did he disarrange his bedclothes, to make believe that he had gone to bed? And if he was in bed, why, when he heard a noise, did he take the trouble to dress himself from head to foot, 
instead of slipping on anything that came to hand. I went to his room on the first day, while you were at lunch. His slippers were at the foot of the bed. What prevented him from putting them on, rather than his heavy nailed boots? So far I do not see. So far, in fact, you cannot see anything except anomalies. They appeared much more suspicious to me, however, when I learned that Charpenet the painter, the man who copied the Rubens pictures, had been introduced and recommended to the Comte de Gevre by Jean de Val himself. Well, well, from that to the conclusion that Jean de Val and Charpenet were accomplices required but a step. I took that step at the time of our conversation. A little quickly, I think. As a matter of fact, a material proof was wanted. Now, I had discovered in Duval's room, on one of the sheets of the blotting pad on which he used to write, this address. Monsieur A. L. N., Post Office 45, Paris. You will find it there still, traced the reverse way on the blotting paper. The next day it was discovered that the telegram sent by the sham flyman from St. Nicholas bore the same address. A. L. N., Post Office 45. The material proof existed. Jean de Val was in correspondence with the gang which arranged the robbery of the pictures. Monsieur Fiol raised no objection. Agreed. The complicity is established. Then what conclusion do you draw? This, first of all, that it was not the runaway who killed Jean de Val, because Jean de Val was his accomplice. And after that? Monsieur de Juge d'Instruction, I will ask you to remember the first sentence uttered by Monsieur le Comte when he recovered from fainting. The sentence forms part of Mademoiselle de Chevre's evidence and is in the official report. I am not wounded. De Val, is he alive? The knife? And I will ask you to compare it with that part of his story, also in the report, in which Monsieur le Comte describes the assault. The man leapt at me and felled me with a blow on the temple. How could Monsieur de Gevre, who had fainted, know on waking that Duval had been stabbed with a knife? Isidore Beautrelet did not wait for an answer to his question. It seemed as though he were in a hurry to give the answer himself and to avoid all comment. He continued straight away. Therefore it was Jean de Val who brought the three burglars to the drawing-room, while he was there with the one whom they call their chief. A noise was heard in the boudoir. De Val opened the door. Recognizing Monsieur de Gevre, he rushed at him, armed with the knife. Monsieur de Gevre succeeded in snatching the knife from him, struck him with it, and himself fell, on receiving a blow from the man whom the two girls were to see a few minutes after. Once again, Monsieur Fiol and the inspector exchanged glances. Ganimard tossed his head in a disconcerted way. The magistrate said, Monsieur le Comte, am I to believe that this version is correct? Monsieur de Gevre made no answer. Come, Monsieur le Comte, your silence would us to suppose. I beg you to speak. Replying in a very clear voice, Monsieur de Gevre said, the version is correct in every particular. The magistrate gave a start. Then I cannot understand why you misled the police. Why conceal an act which you were lawfully entitled to commit in defence of your life? For twenty years, said Monsieur de Gevre, Deval worked by my side. I trusted him. If he betrayed me, as the result of some temptation or other, I was at least unwilling for the sake of the past that his treachery should become known. You were unwilling, I agree, but you had no right to be. I am not of your opinion, Monsieur le Juge d'Instruction. As long as no innocent person was accused of the crime, I was absolutely entitled to refrain from accusing the man who was at the same time the culprit and the victim. He is dead." I consider death a sufficient punishment. But now, Monsieur le Comte, now that the truth is known, you can speak. Yes. Here are two rough drafts of letters written by him to his accomplices. I took them from his pocket-book a few minutes after his death. 
and the motive of his theft? Go to 18, Rue de la Barre, at Dieppe, which is the address of a certain Madame Verdier. It was for this woman, whom he got to know two years ago, and to supply her constant need of money, that Duval turned thief. So everything was cleared up. The tragedy rose out of the darkness and gradually appeared in its true light. Let us go on, said Monsieur Fiole, after the Count had withdrawn. Upon my word, said Beautrelet gaily, I have said almost all that I had to say. But the runaway, the wounded man, as to that, Monsieur le Juge d'Instruction, you know as much as I do. You have followed his tracks in the grass by the cloisters. You have— Yes, yes, I know. But since then, his friends have removed him. And what I want is a clue or two as regards that inn. Isidore Beautrelet burst out laughing. The inn? The inn does not exist. It's an invention. A trick to put the police on the wrong scent. An ingenious trick, too. For it seems to have succeeded. But Dr. Delattre declares, Ah, that's just it, cried Beautrelet in a tone of conviction. It is just because Dr. Delattre declares that we mustn't believe him. Why, Dr. Delattre refused to give any but the vaguest details concerning his adventure. He refused to say anything that might compromise his patient's safety. And suddenly he calls attention to an inn... You may be sure that he talked about that inn because he was told to. You may be sure that the whole story which he dished up to us was dictated to him under the threat of terrible reprisals. The doctor has a wife. The doctor has a daughter. He is too fond of them to disobey people, of whose formidable power he has seen proofs, and that is why he has assisted your efforts by supplying the most precise clues." So precise that the inn is nowhere to be found. So precise that you have never ceased looking for it, in the face of all probability, and that your eyes have been turned away from the only spot where the man can be, the mysterious spot which he has not left, which he has been unable to leave ever since the moment when, wounded by Mademoiselle de saint varin he succeeded in dragging himself to it, like a beast to its lair. But where, confound it all? In what corner of Hades? In the ruins of the old abbey. But there are no ruins left. A few bits of wall, a few broken columns. That's where he's gone to earth, Monsieur le Juge d'Instruction, shouted Beautrelet. That's where you will have to look for him. It's there and nowhere else that you will find Arsène Lupin. Azen Lupin! yelled Monsieur Fiole, springing to his feet. There was a rather solemn pause, amid which the syllables of the famous name seemed to prolong their sound. Was it possible that the vanquished and yet invisible adversary, whom they had been hunting in vain for several days, could really be Arsène Lupin? Arsène Lupin, caught in a trap, arrested, meant immediate promotion, fortune, glory to any examining magistrate. Ganimar had not moved a limb. Isidore said to him, You agree with me, do you not, Monsieur Inspector? Of course I do. You have not doubted either for a moment, have you, that he managed this business? Not for a second. The thing bears his signature. A move of Arsène Lupin's is as different from a move made by another man as one face is from another. You have only to open your eyes. Do you think so? Do you think so? said Monsieur Fiole. Think so? cried the young man. Look, here's one little fact. What are the initials under which those men correspond among themselves? A-L-N. That is to say, the first letter of the name Arsène, and the first and last letters of the name Lupin. Ah, said Ganimard, nothing escapes you. Upon my word, you're a fine fellow, and old Ganimard lays down his arms before you. Beautrelet flushed with pleasure and pressed the hand which the chief inspector held out to him. The three men had drawn near the balcony 
and their eyes now took in the extent of the ruins. Monsieur Fiole muttered, So he ought to be there. He is there, said Beautrelet in a hollow voice. He has been there ever since the moment when he fell. Logically and practically, he could not escape without being seen by Mademoiselle de saint Varin and the two servants. What proof have you? His accomplices have furnished the proof. On the very morning, one of them disguised himself as a flyman and drove you here. To recover the cap, which would serve to identify him. Very well. But also, and more particularly, to examine the spot, find out and see for himself what had become of the governor. And did he find out? I presume so, as he knew the hiding place. And I presume that he became aware of the desperate condition of his chief, because, under the impulse of his alarm, he committed the imprudence to write that threat, Woe betide the young lady if she has killed the governor. But his friends were able to take him away afterward. When? Your men have never left the ruins. And where could they have moved him to? At most a few hundred yards away, for one doesn't let a dying man travel. And then you would have found him. No, I tell you, he is there. His friends would never have removed him from the safest of hiding places. It was there that they brought the doctor, while the gendarmes were running to the fire like children. But how is he living? How will he keep alive? To keep alive you need food and drink. I can't say. I don't know. But he is there, I will swear it. He is there, because he can't help being there. I am as sure of it as if I touched him. He is there. With his finger outstretched toward the ruins, he traced in the air a little circle, which became smaller and smaller until it was only a point. And that point his two companions sought desperately, both leaning into space, both moved by the same faith in Beautrelet and quivering with the ardent conviction which he had forced upon them. Yes, Arsène Lupin was there. In theory and in fact, he was there. Neither of them was now able to doubt it. And there was something impressive and tragic in knowing that the famous adventurer was lying in some dark shelter below the ground, helpless, feverish, and exhausted. And if he dies asked Monsieur Fiole in a low voice. If he dies, said Beautrelet, and if his accomplices are sure of it, then see to the safety of Mademoiselle de saint Varin, Monsieur le Juge d'Instruction, for the vengeance will be terrible. This is B.J. Harrison, I hope you've enjoyed this unabridged production of The Hollow Needle, Part 2 of 7, by Maurice LeBlanc. If you've enjoyed this book, please visit our website at classictalesaudiobooks.com and sign up to be a financial supporter. Donate $5 a month and get a monthly coupon code for $8 off any audiobook. You'll be glad you did. Thank you for joining me today and allowing classic literature to awaken your better self. Please join me every week, and we'll rediscover the greatest stories ever put to paper. <laughs>